And I would like to start by uh, acknowledging uh, country. So we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and connections to land, sea and community. Uh, we pay our respects to elders past, present and future and extend that respect to any like Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. We, we acknowledge that sovereignty was never, never ceded. Uh, as Esther has flagged, we are uh, all on quite different lands potentially. Uh, I'm in Roseville down the southern end of the um, uh, electorate. Uh, where the land is, uh, the, the Camaragal people of the Darug Nation are the traditional owners of the land. Um, and tonight we have a great panel conversation on the role of the arts and the ABC in a thriving democracy. Uh, and it's going to be moderated by um, Esther Anatolidis, uh, who you will have heard already. <laughs> um, you will also have the opportunity to ask questions uh, of the panel throughout the conversation. Uh, there are lots of us online, so if you do have any questions, please pop them in the chat as Esther has flagged. Um, so without further ado, um, I might introduce Esther and then she can introduce the rest of the, the panel. Uh, so Esther is one of Australia's leading advocates for arts, culture and creative industries. Uh, she's the deputy, deputy chair of the Contemporary Arts Precincts and a former board member of ACMI, Elbow Room, the Arts Industry Council Victoria and Regional Arts Australia. She's held creative industry CEO positions from 2004 and has been appointed as an honorary associate professor at RMIT School of the Art. I'll now hand over to Esther to introduce the rest of the panel and start the conversation. Thanks, Esther. Thanks, Ed. How fantastic to be here, everyone. Um, so first of all, good evening there. Um, uh, if you are in, um, um, in, in, in Bradfield uh, on the lands of the Daramaragal, the Darug and the Garingai people, um, my greatest respects to their elders. Meanwhile, uh, I'm here on the lands of the Boonwurrung, Bunurong and Woiwurrung Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation here in Nara, Melbourne, um, whose sovereignty, of course, was never ceded um, and um, uh, we, we are all on lands um, on, on the lands of, of first peoples wherever we are across Australia our deepest respects to their elders uh, past and present so as Ed said I'm Esther Anatolitis I'm our guest host for this evening's agenda setting discussion here in Bradfield now, very few electorates are named in honour of an artist. In fact, I can't think of any. And yet here we are in the Federal Division of Bradfield, which is named after the chief design advocate of the Sydney Opera House. Um, okay, he was uh, actually a civil engineer and not an artist. Uh, and his technical work was, was actually carried out by an uncredited woman, Kathleen M. Butler, which is quite a familiar story. Uh, so it's quite apt and timely that we should be here tonight to talk about what the arts and the ABC contribute to our democracy at a time when confidence and trust in democracy is at an all-time low uh, and by some absolute coincidence the sitting member here in Bradfield is the Minister for Communications and the Arts. So let's talk about the role of the arts and the ABC in a thriving democracy. Tonight's speakers are very much in the need no introduction category, but let's welcome them more warmly. First of all, Nate Jilks is an award-winning musician and artistic director at Marion Street Theatre for Young People. Welcome, Nate. Secondly, Lara Merritt is an Australian visual artist, winner of numerous art prizes, uh, including the recent Ravenswood Australian Women's Art Prize. Welcome and congratulations, Lara. <laughs> Thirdly, Kerry O'Brien um, is a, a prominent, I've got here. No, he's a legendary, legendary Australian journalist and author, winner of six Walkley Awards, plus a Logie. Welcome to Kerry. Kathy McGowan, uh, the amazing Kathy McGowan, the first independent uh, for Indi and the first female independent to sit on the parliamentary crossbench. Now, Kathy is going to join us by a device which I will later call the time machine. So later on, uh, Kerry and I are going to step into the time machine. We'll, we'll see that in, 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 in a little minute. And of course, independent candidate for uh, Bradfield, Nicolette Buller. Welcome, Nicolette. Mm -hmm. So please make them all feel welcome in your favourite digital way. Um, we're going to hear from each one of them um, on uh, tonight's big bold topic, which is what role do public broadcasters and the arts play both locally and nationally in maintaining a thriving democracy? How should the arts and public interest journalism be supported through policy and public investment? 
And how do independents support strong communities and a thriving democracy? So particularly in speaking to Nate and Lara, we're going to hear about their practices, about being an artist, about running an arts organisation. With Kerry, we'll talk more broadly about some integrity and, 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 and a range of issues. Um, uh, but look, as you know, uh, a discussion like this of an hour and a half does tend to pass very, very quickly. We're going to get chatting and before we know it, the time will fly by. So please, as you think of your question for these amazing people, please enter it into the chat at any time. Just, you know, type it right in. Um, apologies in advance that, you know, likely it won't be possible to respond to every question. But of course, there's still a good few days left between now and election day for you to put those questions to a range of candidates um, wherever you are, whether you're in, in Bradfield or in, or in other electorates, uh, there is plenty of time to, to put your questions. So I'm going to start by setting the scene a little bit about the arts. I should say um, we also had um, another guest, Tim Minchin, uh, who has been unavailable at the last minute uh, due to, you know, being a, a, a fantastically successful artist. Uh, and so uh, his big apologies from Tim for not being able to join us as well. So let's uh, set the scene a little bit and then we will hear um, from Nate and then from Lara, and then from Kerry, and then later um, from um, Nick, of course. So, arts and journalism. Australians rely on artists and journalists to be fearless. We rely on them to create uh, the most um, astounding, thrilling, inspiring, heartbreaking, important work uh, to, to stand up to um, um, uh, authority, speak truth to power, uh, to, um, uh, to, to create the kinds of work that, that inspires and shapes our world and to do so, as they say in, in journalism in the public service without fear or favour. More than 98% of Australians participate in the arts as makers or audience members, and 100% of us rely on the media to inform our work, in fact, our, our world, in fact, there's probably more than 100% of us. The most moving artwork, the most compelling journalism is created by people who apply their expertise and their craft in true independence. The most confident and democratic governments in the world go out of their way to champion our most creative and critical voices. But instead, in recent years, we've seen an unprecedented level of politicised attacks on artists and public broadcasters. We've seen their integrity called into question without any basis whatsoever, uh, at the same time as the integrity of politicians is being questioned for absolutely entirely valid and important reasons. And disappointingly, uh, we've seen some terribly silly culture warriors engaging with arts and journalism only to ridicule and undermine. So clearly something is profoundly wrong there and plenty needs to change. Um, the arts industry, um, the, uh, the, the media have expressed a great many concerns. There's no comprehensive uh, policy, for example, to put First Nations first, to resource high quality education, support career pathways, make it possible uh, for all Australians to enjoy great work um, and for um, the media uh, to continue uh, in, a, you know, in its trusted and important ways. So what's needed there is some kind of healthy balance between enabling frameworks and championing creativity and rigour. Um, art and journalism, which are the most important forces in Australia. We fund creative and critical work because they're public goods, because arts, culture and public interest, journalism enrich all of our lives. And of course, we couldn't understand our own humanity. We could understand ourselves, who we are, where we've come from, without uh, the images, the songs, the stories that inspire and inform us. So how do artists and journalists work? What's changed in recent years to make some of that crucial work more difficult? And how should the arts and public interest journalism be supported through policy and public investment? 
Before we go to Nate, I'm just going to remind everyone, please mute your audio. Um, you might also like to mute your video as well. Uh, that'll just make the bandwidth a bit easier for everyone, including yourself. So just take that little moment now to make sure that your audio is muted. Uh, and let's go to Nate. Tell us about Marion Street Theatre, your work in nurturing the ecology um, and what's needed. Hi, Nate. Oh, hello, Esther. Thanks, oh, thanks for an introduction. That's really, that's, that's terrific. Um, g'day, everyone. I'm Nate Jilts. I'm the Artistic Director of Marion Street Theatre for Young People. Uh, definitely, if you're in the Bradfield area, uh, you'll know us. Uh, we're hyper-local. Um, got so much energy, lots of kids. We, uh, and yet many of you might have brought your kids or your grandkids to work, uh, to our work uh, over the past 52 years. I know Nicolette was in a Marion Street show uh, initially, which was great to find out. And I'm so, uh, it's so thrilled. Welcome. And I can see a lot of Marion Street people uh, in the, uh, in the uh, audience tonight. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm absolutely honoured uh, to be joining this panel. Um, and thank you so much, Nicolette, for, for the invitation. Um, you know, for me, um, my practice is in music uh, and as a theatre maker and director, um, and I've worked all around uh, the country and the world, uh, and now um, in our home base here in Gordon, on beautiful Durham Good country, uh, where our Marion Street hub is. Um, I believe the arts has the potential to show us who we are, to be a reflector of our social fabric, to reflect our democratic values. And it's why I've dedicated my life, my professional life to my practice. You know, we hear a lot about the value of the arts in terms of economic output, about jobs, and that's true and great. But I think what we're dealing that with now goes much, much further and much deeper. We have an opportunity now, as COVID appears to be in some sense settling down, to really consider what we value, what we want from the next period of the century, and now to lay the groundwork for that. The arts has to play a crucial role. And I'm so glad, and Esther, you'll, you'll know this because you've just come from three arts events today. Four, in fact, I saw you in the first one. Uh, <laughs> and that the spotlight is really on the arts um, this evening. Um, our storytelling reflects who we are, our values and our culture. And it shows us our Australianness in all its quirky forms. In the youth arts, the sector that I love and that I work in, I believe that young people should be the center of our arts policy. Youth arts should be the jewel in the crown of the arts in Australia. It should, be the, it should be central in our national policy when we have one, and we will have one. Young people are our future, and we all have a stake in what that future looks like. Young people are one of the powerless groups in our society. They have very little buying power. They don't have a vote. Transport for them is difficult, and often they lack agency in the suburbs. But they're gonna be the next leaders. They're gonna be the next creators in Australia. They have the power to shape the next 50 years and they'll be the leaders of the next century. So we need to think bigger to facilitate opportunities and to create an environment where big thinking is possible. And this is where the arts come in. It's where the ABC comes in, big thinking. There's even a program on the ABC called Big Ideas. It's about big thinking and big stuff. I listen to it every week, I love it. I wanna see our young people taking more ownership of their story and having a stake in their own story. And we all have a stake in how they grow up. Some of the biggest issues that face our young people in Bradfield uh, right now are around identity, around recognition and inclusion. And where is the platform you get to encounter yourself as a 14 or 15 year old, if not in the arts? Where is the place to bring up those big dangerous ideas or to encounter great writers, to really connect and be moved by the great, by great works, you know, in the way that often we have them in our lives. In my year eight music theater ensemble, students tell me they are already worried about the subjects they're gonna choose in year nine to facilitate a university place at 13 years old. Surely that kind of pressure is not good for democratic mindedness or for trying to experiment or for finding a foothold and to set up what could be a really glorious and productive life. We are asking our, our young people to have too many answers. The young people are already feeling the pressure of the modern economy. They're already on the road to being part of an economy and not part of a society. But when you talk to business, they value creativity as their number one skill that they're looking for. But surely creativity has to be fundamentally about things that we don't know. It has to be about discovery and exploration. 
I'm also deeply concerned that our young people don't feel ownership of our civic and cultural spaces. I try to reiterate to our students at Marion Street that the Sydney Opera House is their building, that the Karingai Town Hall right here in Bradfield is their building. They own these spaces, as do we. And that's where institutions like the ABC have a role to play, to broadcast and present the ideas, but also that we need to recognise that we have a stake in the ABC and we and our young people have a stake in its ownership. I think we can change the conversation, but I think we have to change the activity. It's about funding, yes, and it's about resourcing, but that's not all of it. Let's make it now about participation. Let's make it now about expression and let's make it about inclusion. You know, during the pandemic, we had at Marion Street a very rare opportunity to develop a work uh, called Testament. It was a large scale rock concept album, which is right up my alley, yeah, which unpacked the idea of aging and ageism in Bradfield. We asked the question, what does it mean to grow up and what does it mean to grow old in Australia? In the work, there was an old lady who's, who is 88 years old, her name is Dora, and she lives in a little cul-de-sac street in West Pimble. And she told the story of how as a five-year-old in Italy during the Second World War, she held the hand of her aunt as they fled the bombing of her town. Not unlike some things that are in the news right now. The bombs hit a tower on the hill which caused the water to cascade down around her feet. She described it as this bad rain raining down. Bad rain. It's a great line. It's a great story and it became a great lyric. She's five years old. Dora now lives in the cul-de-sac street in West Pimble, having raised a family and contributed to the development of 20th century Australia. She shared this story with 18 year old Grace as part of the project who lives down the road and together through Testament, we set it to music. We wrote a song about Dora. Her life was interpreted through the eyes of an 18 year old. We brought in the, lo the local orchestra, national treasures like Kamal, who's a bloody legend. We oh. recorded the, st the studio album locally and we launched it on Spotify. It's there for as long as the internet is there. You can check it out now. We could put a spotlight on this story because of the participation, but the story was existing in plain sight. The story of Australia was hiding in plain sight. And Dora's story is just one of hundreds of stories that are out there that the arts can spotlight. And it wouldn't have been possible without funding and the support of our leaders and decision makers, but it needed participants overall. This year, we're taking it to the next level with a work embracing our cross-cultural roots in Bradfield with a work uh, embedded in China and Australia. We're gonna present our first Mandarin language work called The Red Dust right here in the public civic space of Karingai Town Hall. Leaders and Nicolette, if I can implore you, let's reinstate the value of arts, of creative values and of artistic thinking. I think we can change the conversation by changing the activity, but let's make it about participation. Let's make it about expression and let's make it about inclusion. Let's give our young people a voice. Let's let them participate in our democracy, give them a platform and let's fund our future. Oh, bloody brilliant, Nate. Let's just do all of that. <laughs> <laughs> just oh, exactly exactly this is the kind of invigorating uh that 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 we need in everything that that comes next politically and also in our hearts and our minds as we go out into the world so thank you so much nate now let's hear from lara lara having heard all that uh and um, working in a practice that is very different um, from what nate's just described tell us a bit about i guess yeah your vision for what's next on the on the in, in the groundingness of, of your own practice oh wow well, where to start um first of all i probably should say i'm on gadigal land uh and um I'm really uh, excited to be part of this conversation. Um, as the sort of visual artist on this board, I feel sort of a, a bit daunted by everyone's um, XPs and, uh, uh, you know, in, in speaking their ideas when I'm really in a studio, um, very much working with my materials and experimenting and, um, and playing and building and making things. But I, I also think there's a misconception with the visual arts that we are alone. And a big mm -hmm. part of my practice is working with community and bringing people into the art making space. Um, I, I come from a painting background. So I've been working 
as paint. Uh, that's what I studied 30 years ago and have been exhibiting ever since. Um, there was a part in my own practice as an artist where I felt like just working solo and exhibiting regularly wasn't enough for me. And I, I wanted to sort mm. of branch and feel like where could, if I opened up, what does it mean to paint and why do we keep going back to this medium that's been around for years? Um, how can that, how, how does that have a place today, I suppose, when we're competing with Netflix and I, you know, a lot of visual medium, um, where, does, where does painting fit into all of that? And um, that really excites me, that question, because I suppose it comes down to why, why do we make and why do we want to create, um, connect with people through this medium? So um, a really important work in my practice was a couple of, a few years ago, was when I was invited to make an installation painting work at the MCA. And that work was called um, Paint Me In. And Paint Me In was inviting the audience to take off their shoes, come into a room at the Museum of Contemporary Art and really um, relate to this painting very differently to what they would normally do. Um, I, I had kind of made big canvases strung from a ceiling that would rotate and I invited people to crawl inside them and be um, sort of almost really held by the painting. And um, I love that idea that um, for me, that, that's why I've followed a sort of life in the studio and making work is to be um, sort of be by, sort of feel quite small and um, be consumed by it. Also a connection to nature, with, which is how I feel um, being in the natural world as well. Um, so that's just one of the examples where um, my practice has sort of gone not from a general um, painting studio exhibiting line, but as um, I've also, um, I now like to, when I make work, invite the community into being, um, putting their hand into the painting. So often I will make large canvases and uh, work with different groups of people. Um, I've worked at the University of Queensland and on their student campus where for two weeks we painted outdoors and made big cloth um, monochrome paintings together. And through that process of um, sitting together, we were able to, um, to create one big work that got constructed. And, and I love the way that conversation and connection came from that, that process really. Um, so that's sort of where I've come from. And, um, but what I'm seeing right now and what I'm most excited about, I suppose, is um, coming up to um, this election and just things I've been thinking about um, how artists deal with, they really do respond to the present big moment was the 2020 fires um, on the South Coast where I was quite affected in my own community down South. And I was able to um, invite, um, uh, invite artists sort of call to action and see if I could, um, it's, sorry, it's a quite of a long story, <laughs> so I don't know. Basically, there was um, a bit of unburnt forest that hadn't, hadn't been um, burnt by the bushfires and there was a small community that wanted to save this parcel of land from a development. And why this story is so heartening to me is because I was able to really pick up the phone to my arts community, my other fellow artists um, in Sydney and around Australia. And I had an idea that if I, they could send me some paintings to, um, to sort of surround the wire fence that was the area that was going to be developed. And instead of sending me um, artworks, they said, I think would be really important. I think this was um, post first lockdown. If we come to this regional area and we want to see firsthand the devastation from the 2020 fires, we've heard about this complete destruction of the environment and we feel really helpless being in the city. And, um, and it was the most incredible um, exchange where you had artists from Sydney and from other areas coming to a small town and being hosted by the town. And through the process of um, 
them making work in situ in this very burnt landscape, but next to a thriving forest that was about to be cut down, um, we had this exchange of a regional area, artists working there out in the open. It was an incredibly generous sort of act. And um, I just felt that this was a really win-win situation. The community itself had a lot of healing to do and needed that. And the artists as well really felt like if they were gonna make things, they wanted it to count and matter because um, art doesn't happen by itself in a room on their own. It, it, you know, they're very much responding to what they're reading and seeing. And it was this sort of firsthand exchange. Um, and I felt the power of art in this situation was, um, was, was something I've never experienced before. So oh, that, was, that, was a, that was a really big breaking moment for me and my work as an artist. Yeah, um, I, and um, I just, I suppose my one sort of point coming to tonight's um, talk was, I just was a really advocating, I think the role that artists um, are able to just have an amazing contribution and are so generous with their time. You know, as an artist, we don't get paid a weekly salary or we don't know what we are gonna earn from one year to the next. And sometimes we have a, um, a very successful win, like I did the other night with the Ravenswood Art Prize, or whether you're going to win or not, you don't know. So um, to, to get that, you know, but then there are other times where for years, you know, you will be maybe not selling much work or not, you know, but you're still incredibly generously um, giving your time to different organisations, whether it's the local school or whether it's working um, voluntarily, um, or um, another, another example, which I think is astounding, is that um, we also, myself and a couple of other artists, put on a uh, auction post the bushfires, and we had an exhibition and auction at the National Art School in Sydney. And within a week, we had over 100 works by artists donating this for the auction and raised a quarter of a million dollars towards communities that needed this fund, funding. Um, and I, I'm just always blown away that that can happen so quickly and that people are willing to step and do that when it's needed. Um, so for me, the, the arts is not a separate organisation of, you know, where somebody, it's an exchange of where you make something and someone buys it. It's a really woven into the fabric of how we communicate and talk to each other and treat each other and, and, um, and hopefully open you up to ideas and beauty as well oh Lara, so um that's my that's my little spiel <laughs> about my i don't know just, i don't want to read anything that's that's how i feel about yeah of just a couple of examples that have happened recently and um my future in working in painting is that um it's all about connection for me it doesn't mean anything if it doesn't affect or communicate to somebody else and so I'm really motivated to, to tell those stories and connect in the process of making and experimenting affect people and make them hungry to make something of their own and to make them want to, you know, do what I've done with them with a whole group of people because I believe that everybody needs that in their life and makes it, it's a sense of meaning and yeah. um, what, makes, you know, what makes you get out of bed. Yeah. So I, I'm just getting some crunchiness from Lara's. Yeah, I'm very happy to have any questions. But um, yeah, it's, it's lovely to speak in this. In a, I'm very passionate about these um, issues with the arts. And I like to sort of break down any sort of stereotypes of um, what an artist is. And um, because I'm, I'm always amazed everyone's got their own style and mediums and practice, but the generosity within the arts community, I find incredible. And um, I, I can't, um, and, and yes, I said, the wins are great when you get the funding and the grants, but they, they don't come regularly. And there's so, and I think every artist I know can speak of a time when they got a grant or an amount that literally just changed their project, like where they where they went in their careers um, and so that's why it's so important to for the for the government to recognize these contributions and to foster and encourage um, 
these activities and to make more opportunities because life is pretty dull without <laughs> the colour and the feeling and the emotion of the arts. Yeah. Oh, precisely, yeah. Lara. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for going into such great detail about your own mm. practice, but also reminding us how generous artists always are when it comes to getting out there and, and creating work and supporting each other through crises, uh, with fundraising around the fires. Yeah, yeah there is. Um, it's just so great for everyone here to, to have that, that deep insight into how artists work. So thank you. Thank you. Now, next up, we're going to hear from Kerry O'Brien. And um, to take us there, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna wave a quick hi to Kerry because Kerry and I are going to step into the time machine that I described earlier. And we're going to go back in time uh, to last night. Um, we need some kind of great Scooby Doo uh, dissolve there um, and have. A conversation with Kathy McGowan, who couldn't be here tonight, but could be here last night. So uh, is over to Team Nick uh, to create the Scooby Doo Dissolve and uh, enter us into the time machine uh, to hear that great conversation with Kathy, and then uh, we'll hear from Kerry right after that. Just going to get my audio on there. Almost there. Here we go. The earlier part of the conversation, because uh, not both of our speakers could be available for tonight's conversation. But let's continue where we left off. We started speaking about um, the, the importance of um, um, an environment, a, a society, a democracy where artists and journalists are valued. Um, and we were talking about how important it is um, for all Australians that artists and journalists can be fearless in the work that they do and the work that they create. So for this part of the conversation, um, it is utterly thrilling to be joined by former member for INVI, Kathy McGowan, and um, uh, former ABC journalist um, and ABC alumni, Kerry O'Brien. Esther. Hello, both of you. So how important is it? Uh, let's start with, with Kathy as someone who has been, um, and in many ways, of course, still is a community leader. How important is it um, that artists and journalists are able to be fearless in what they do? So hello, everybody, and good evening. I'm delighted to be part of tonight's conversation, not only from the, the point that you're making, Esther, about policy and about artists, but I, my real focus is on community and the absolute power of artists in community. And what I discovered, which wasn't rocket science, but the whole notion of being the change you're wanting to see, not just talking about it. So as part of my campaigning work, was to bring artists into the political campaign and to, to have, have art integrated into everything that we did during the campaign. And consequently, the discussion wasn't removed. Um, people, volunteers, everybody was talking and doing art all the time. So just to give you a bit of a framework, so we had, um, we had a, a, a group, we called them the makers, um, and they made things. Uh, they made they made art. They made cockatoos. They made uh, jewelry. They made clothing. They made bandanas. They bought sewing machines in. But all they did pottery. They did ceramics. They made jewelry. They did all sorts of art. And most of this was available as merchandise, but also as gifts. So we had that sort of makers. We had a choir. So we had music. Music permeated everything we did. So on Friday nights when we'd gather in the Wodonga Hub. There'd always be music. Um, we had our own choir, we had our own song. But also, as I say, we had a choir. So our, our way of campaigning was to walk around towns singing our song. All sorts of people would turn up. So we had music and we had role plays. So we had drama and theatre and we brought that into the training that we used. So when people were thinking about, oh, I don't want to go door knocking, I've never done door knocking. The theatre people came in and we workshopped 
and we role played and we we played it up and we brought to the we brought to the the training the art and the joy and the laughter of live theater and playback theater um, we did poetry. We regularly had poetry evenings when people, you know, spoke about how they're feeling and the emotion of the campaign. And of course, writing, uh, people writing articles, writing letters, writing commentary on the whole process. So through that integration, it was never a foreign thing to talk about art and the campaign. So, um, and, and I think that's what's happened with, I, I would say, I think there has been a disconnect right across the political movement art has become polit politicised in, in a sense, not in not communicised, but removed from the community. And so therefore it becomes an issue is how do we, how do we have community value art when they haven't had the direct experience of it? So many important points in what you've just said there, Cathy. First of all, of course, that um, when we think back to our childhoods, to school, no matter um, you know the, the cultural context in which we were raised, we learn through art. We learn by singing. We all learn the alphabet by singing it. We learn to understand our um, emotions. Um, we, 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 we find ourselves um, uh, feeling surges of emotion that when we experience that in different ways. When we sit down to make things together, and this is something that we learn from our first peoples, the oldest continuing culture, when we sit down to make things together, um, we learn so much more about ourselves and each other. And there's a real confidence and emboldening, isn't there? It's kind of a, um, there's a sharing um, but there's a way in which um, we've kind of recomposed um, our thinking and, and, and formed some bonds. Um, I think it's very um, telling also that um, in, in giving a story about community, um, uh, we can't help but go uh, to the politicisation of art in recent years, um, whether it's about policy and funding, whether it's about direct attacks, um, and um, that has been really disappointing to see um, members of, of parliament um, directly attack artists, researchers, uh, humanities students, people trying to, to you know, um, uh, study for their degrees and so on. Um, and, um, and that's something that um, is a challenge for the way that we all um, are educated the way that we all have the experience of enjoying work, of experiencing work. Uh, before we go to Kerry, Kathy, tell us a bit about um, um, what you've seen in the years since you've been um, uh, a Member of Parliament um, in the way that um, artists locally, uh, where, where you live, um, but also from what you've been seeing nationally, um, what's changed? Mm. How has that politicisation been evidenced? Oh, look, I couldn't comment. I've been, I'm a, I live in Victoria and we've basically been in lockdown mode forever, God help us, and we're just coming out of it now. So um, I couldn't, I, 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 but of course, we saw the failure of the system to support artists. We saw the failure of the, you know, the system to support universities and the absolute, um, oh, I, I think, the value-laden way that that job keeper was paid out. But, you know, all, everyone I know in Victoria just went into our bunkers and, and stayed there basically for two years. And we're only slowly coming out now. But, and, and in, in, again, in Victoria, the, the, the community theatre is coming back. Um, we've got uh, festivals beginning to happen again. But it's very, very slow. So I think I, I couldn't comment on anywhere other than my own little world in that in that context. And we certainly have been our own little world, haven't we, Kerry? I mean, what, what, one of the things that would have been fantastic uh, during an extended period of enjoying each other through this and enjoying art and the news through this, it would have been great to have had um, a government approach that... Um, perhaps uh, introduced, strengthened or increased content quotas for local work. In fact, those were slashed, making it more difficult um, for um, Australian stories to appear on free-to-air or um, subscription streaming services. What else have you seen, Kerry, in the last few years uh, that has made the environment more difficult for people who create work, but also for journalists trying to report uh, on, on, on what we need to know? Well, look, it's a it's a huge topic, Esther. But um, uh, I, I, my starting point is that is that storytelling 
is at the absolute heart of the arts and of culture. Yes. Uh, you know, culture is at the centre of our lives. It permeates our lives, but yet often we don't really define that. We often don't actually see the culture around us. But uh, but when we when we lose that um, the voice uh, of the creative arts in in all their forms, uh, it's it's like it's like a form of starvation. And and the, you know the truth of this pandemic uh, is that we're not really going to be able to measure the cost for a long time, and in some ways we'll never measure the cost. Uh, and some people will recover well, uh, some people okay and some people not very well at all. I mean, how do you, how do you measure uh, the, 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 the budding artist who was on the threshold of, of the great bloom of their creative career, if you like, and suddenly it just stops like that. And, uh, and they sit in a corner of their home and maybe some of them can still create, maybe they've been able to use as some have the internet to a degree, uh, but incomes have stopped dead, People have lost confidence. People have really suffered. That is the artists themselves, uh, with, as Cathy said, uh, very little um, uh, special or extra support, having had their livelihoods cut from them. And there was a sense of punishment about that. To see those sectors uh, of, of our community and of our economy uh, that were not assisted in the way others were, uh, the arts, universities, the ABC, SBS, um, so uh, these things do come at a cost. I mean, artists like journalists um, hold a mirror up to a nation. Uh, the soul of a nation can be very hard to define, but, but in terms of the essence of our country, what the essence is, that, that can be real. You know, it goes to our values, it goes to the things that are near and dear and important to us. It goes to the things that are part of our life force, our spirit. Um, and, and when you see government not respect that, mm. and it's not just this time, I mean, I, I think the history of government support for the arts in Australia has been a very checkered history. Uh, and, uh, and we are a country uh, of a limited population. Yes, it's 25 million, which is a lot more than it was 20 years ago, but nonetheless, to support the kind of uh, the artists and the art that this country is capable of, such a rich, rich tapestry of art across a whole kaleidoscope. Um, and, and, but, but so much of that, we, we do not, we simply don't have the critical mass uh, for, for the arts industries to, um, uh, to be commercially supported. There is always going to be a need for uh, for sponsorships and for subsidies, always. And so, uh, part of my thinking, if 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 we accept that that the creative culture and the, and the broad culture of our country is fundamental to who and what we are, and and you see a government that doesn't actually reflect and value that, then I think it's up to individuals to make their own judgment about the worth of that government as much as you might about their record on unemployment or their record on, on uh, manufacturing industry or any other factor of the economy. So um, how well have we fared in this time? Uh, as I say, um, some people, you know, like bulldozers, dare I say it, uh, <laughs> some people are unstoppable, but, uh, but many people are vulnerable in the arts community. And, uh, and there's a million stories, uh, I'm sure, to be told of, um, of the cost of these last two years. Sadly, yes, absolutely right. Um, and in the conversation we were having earlier, before jumping in here and 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 uh, slipping into time, um, we've just spoken about um, how artists uh, sustain their careers. We've talked about how there were approximately 48, 49,000 practising professional artists in Australia. Um, their average incomes have not budged since the 80s when um, when studies were first undertaken. They're, they're at or below the poverty line. It takes longer, it takes years longer to become an established artist than most other profession. It actually takes longer to be an mm. artist than it does to be a doctor. Um, 
Mm -hmm. And uh, there are many Australian artists who are more renowned um, uh, internationally than they are in Australia because of um, uh, policy uh, problems and failures um, that um, are not supportive of the people who, who create our future. But having... And, and if I can just come in there, is that the, 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 uh, when you talked about uh, artists and journalists being allowed to be fearless, I mean... I, I would suggest if we're doing our job, we don't wait to be allowed. But 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 no, nonetheless, the, the the atmospherics are important. I, I think that, um, and so often you see an artist uh, or a group of artists challenge us all with a particularly um, uh, outrageous um, uh, line of thinking or body of work. Um, but in the challenging, they're encouraging a debate. They might be forcing a debate on us, but 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 that debate is important. I mean, that you know, our brains should never stop. We should our brains should constantly be ferreting through life, um, musing, you know, challenging ourselves and being and, and allowing others to challenge us and appreciating those challenges when they come. And if people are not, if 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 there is an unfriendly environment. For people to push the edges of the envelope, uh, then that leads to an unhealthy situation and, and ultimately it leads to an unhealthy democracy. For journalism, freedom of speech is fundamental. So when a government, when a government orchestrates a raid uh, on the ABC, which is bad enough, but in the intimidating way in which an individual journalist, Annika Smithhurst, uh, was raided in her home and had police going through her drawers and whatever, in search of what, um, in the end, no prosecutions have come out of that. It didn't change the course of the prosecution of the law at all in terms of the cases involved. If you look back on it now, you've got to ask the question, what was that about? And just about everyone in journalism um, is of no doubt that it was about signals of intimidation. So, you know, hopefully journalists see that for what it is and aren't, aren't cowed, and, the, and in this case, every news organisation banded together. But that's not always the case. Yeah, and I think that is a, an important and terrible example. Um, and at the risk of being unpopular, Kerry, uh, I, I, I definitely didn't use the word aloud. I started by saying... Oh, no, I, I was paraphrasing, yeah. Australians rely on artists and journalists to be yeah. fearless. And yeah. so if we zoom out to... Um, uh, to that view of Australian society and of the integrity uh, that we expect in our politicians. Cathy, a society where governments are confident in themselves, confident in their own integrity, in the fact that they actually are upholding a set of values that, 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 that can be justified to, to voters, that kind of society um, has every confidence in artists and journalists to create, to, to report whatever they like. That's, that's, um, that's not the kind of um, uh, confidence and integrity we're seeing from government right now, is it? Mm. Well, it's such an interesting um, position that you put, Esther. I, I don't. I don't see the world like that. Quite frankly, I, I see it quite differently. I, I see the good ship Australian democracy as really important, and at the moment, I think it's off course, and that's that for a whole lot of reasons. The the responsibility for getting it back on course is ours. Um, and we, ours is, as in, I'm saying community, and we need to start rowing, rowing and, and, and using our weight and our expertise to move the ship back onto course. And clearly that's what's happening in Bradfield. You know, the people have got together and they've, they've recognised their own personal power. They've recognised the ability to work as a community in a group. They're running this most amazing campaign uh, they've found uh, somebody in their community who's agreed to be the figurehead for that campaign in Nicolette, and they're, they're very clear about what they want for their society. So that's, in a way, I think, how it ought to be. Um, I don't want to give the power to government ever, unfettered. I, I want... That's what I love about democracy, is that the actual power lies with us, and democracy is not a spectator sport. So the sort of words that you were putting across before was sort of more like, you know, we can trust government to do something. 
Well, I, I don't think you can. I think the whole system works when large numbers of people are actively engaged in it and they're participating in it and they're having the arguments and the debate. And it's exactly, I suppose, what Kerry was saying is that you, the more you have that uh, artist, journalist holding the mirror up to us and us being the community in lots of different ways, shapes or forms, then the more engaged, the more people learn, the more they get, they can grow in that place. And, and it's a role of government, not so much to do that stuff. The role of government I see is to create the framework where we can do the work ourselves. So I'm not at all one for an, a great artistic policy. I am a great one for government having very clear frameworks, uh, very transparent processes that, that are open to scrutiny and then regular review and evaluation on the effectiveness of what they're doing, judged not necessarily by them, but by their community. So that's what I'm actually seeing happening in Australia, which, is, which gives me great delight. And it is quite a different um, position, I think, from traditionally how Australians have seen government. I think in the past, we have seen government very much on the, on the way you've described it. Um, we vote them in, um, they have policies and they do whatever they want, even if they did it with integrity. I, th I don't think that's the answer. I think, um, and, and, and the other thing I, th I see happening, and it's come out of COVID a lot, is this ability through Zoom and, and efforts like tonight, we can engage much, much more ease, easily in the discussion. Uh, and, and I'm really excited by the digital um, natives that I've been working with and their ability to use computers and online uh, communication to create engagement opportunities. So I'm, I'm, I'm for a much more fluid, much more engaged society where the arts play an integrated role. And I don't see government as the answer to it. I see the government as sort of like the, the, the giving circle. We put our money in with taxes, we get some agreement about policy and strategy. I'd like to see happen anyhow. No, it, it makes one of the interesting things. Sorry, sorry. Uh, one of the interesting things about uh, about the phenomenon of the independence uh, is to is I, I believe it is it is absolutely connected with with how the primary vote of both major parties has dropped as significantly as it has. Uh, the Liberals, on the one hand, have have grown used to always polling over forty percent until the very recent past on their primary vote. Uh, Labor, once upon a time, was, was always around or over that 40% mark, and Labor could count on more preferences as a rule than the Libs, so if the Libs had to be ahead of Labor. Now, what you're seeing at the moment is both of them tending to hover around that mid-30% mark. Uh, and, and so you've got a lot of people sitting on the fence, uh, uh, way more people, election by election, sitting on the fence and appearing to leave it until the last moment before they decide. Uh, and, and so that, that is a reflection to me of a broad Australian populace which has increasingly lost faith with the traditional model of Australian politics, which is the two major parties tussling it out and one or other of them becoming the government. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and if nothing else happens in this election, then that the Liberals, who I think have lost their way, they are no longer the party of Menzies, there's no doubt about that. And you can say of Labor that it's no longer quite the party that it was 30, 40 years ago. But, but uh, the big challenge for the Liberal Party as a direct result of the emergence of these independents, largely in traditional Liberal seats, is that if they don't search their souls and come up with the, and, and work out their own reasons why this has happened, this enormous um, expression of a loss of faith, um, if they can't work out that they're going to have to turn themselves around. I mean, I, I was absolutely tickled. I'm, I'm a little bit off your subject for one second, but I just think it's, it's, um, it's almost funny to, to watch the Dave Sharmas and uh, the Zimmermans and, uh, and the Tim Wilsons in Goldstein and, and, even, um, and even Josh Frydenberg, who the Liberals see as a future leader, uh, virtually pleading to be put back uh, into the parliament because it's going to be it's going to be a disaster for their party if they're not that that the that the people who are who have have created such a voice and such a, a kind of lightning rod 
of discontent are now being asked if they will help put the put these moderate liberals back uh, and and somehow they can they can uh, keep their party healthy well the bottom line is the reason the independents are being so successful is the moderates have lost their voice in the parliament they're in the parliament but they've lost their voice there so uh, and it comes back to no, democracy no, you know this is democracy at work it's taken a long time yeah. but this yeah. is democracy working but there's something else that's happened not only it's, i think you're right kerry they've that those members of parliament have lost their voice, that's for sure. <laughs> but but what they've done, and, and it's the thing I just am only beginning to wrap my mind around, and I don't know what the answers, what I don't know what the logic of it is, but they've started, like those seats you all mentioned, they're the blue ribbon safe seats of the Liberal Party, like they are the crown in the jewels, and they're turning. Like Redfield, yeah. Or, you know, Kuyong, Goldstein, they've turned. And as they've turned, those MPs are going, um, they're, they're heaping abuse. <laughs> they're heaping abuse on these people. And oh, there's a certain desperate plea going on, Cathy. Yeah, the, the plea's going on, but then they're calling them groupies and fakes. And the Prime Minister, I think he said, the independents pose a threat to the geopolitical stability of the whole world. Going, yes, now what, this is a good... What's uh... happening in their heads that they think that, that that's going to be the case? This is a good point for us to end on. We've, we've, we, we could easily talk so much longer. Um, but this notion that um, supporting and championing uh, people's right to elect whomsoever they choose and communities' rights to get together and um, talk openly about what's needed, this is somehow um, being um, taken as a legitimate avenue of attack by some of these candidates. It's just, it's gobsmacking. And exactly as you say, Kerry, um, the thing that is causing um, those moderates uh, to... Uh, you know, look like they're going to lose their seats, is exactly the hard work they should have been doing for quite some time. So, Cathy, one last question to you. There are a few days left in the campaign. There are some absolutely ridiculous things that are being said about independence. They're, they're, they're going to, um, uh, yes, explode democracy, ruin the world, uh, make some privileged people uh, very unhappy. Uh, what should everyone listening tonight, uh, what should um, voters be listening out for in the next few days and, and applying that critical, uh, that critical lens um, so that we all uh, vote for a better future? Well, I think the, there's two things to say about this. Just one quick story about the chaos that the government saying that the independence caused. So <laughs> while I was a member of parliament, the chaos came from the coalition. Uh, and there was a particular period of time around 2017, the section 44, when lots of people had to leave parliament on um, dual citizenship. Now, I think about 30 MPs, I'm not quite sure of the number, but I ought to check it, had to go and do either left or had to come back. Mm. One of them was the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. He goes and says, um, everything's, I'm a good man, everything's okay. Oh, no, I'm a New Zealand citizen. Oh, dear, I've got to have an election. No, nothing to see here. But while all that was happening, it was the crossbench of which I was part, Rebecca Sharkey and I, Adam Band, Andrew Wilkie and Bob Catter, that I'd say held the country together because it was, it was ripe for, you know, disaster. So, and it didn't happen because the good, the good ship was held together by the people on the crossbench. And again, in 2018, when the government lost its majority, it was, again, the opportunity there, if you wanted to cause destruction, you could have, but it was, it was the, 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 the crossbench, the sensible crossbench that held the, the place up. So I think I want, I want to say to the people listening tonight in Bradfield, Apply your intelligence to what's being said and don't just believe it because it's said. And I, and I also want to say over the next four days, five days till Saturday, there is such an opportunity to, to engage in politics. And it's not so much about policy. I think the time for real heavy discussion on policy has basically passed. But now it's about talking to the people in your circle 
and saying, I'm voting for Nicolette. Have you given it some thought? And if you haven't, what would it take for me to convince you that she's a good person? And not just doing that on the pre-poll, but doing it through phone calls, wearing the T-shirts up the street, engaging people in conversation and using the personal statement that I'm supporting Nicolette, um, what, you know, you're a friend, you're a part of my family, what about you doing it as well? So I think it's actually now the time for personal um, endorsement to actually carry the weight. But it won't just happen. Uh, people have actually got to do the work over the next five days, which is phoning people up, calling them to have a come and have a cup. Strategically, people who might be sitting on the fence, who might be thinking that they'll vote for Paul Fletcher again or might vote some other way. So to actually bring them into the fold of the conversation and then one by one, do the listening, do the active listening and actually acknowledging that here's and now is a chance where your vote can actually make a difference if they use it widely wisely. So that would be my call to action tonight. I think we, we, we passed the time where people are going to intellectualise about what's better or what's worse. I think, as Kerry said, people are sitting on the fence, they're a little bit worried, and they just need a bit of hand, um, a friendly smile, hop off the fence, come and stand with me, and just this once, use your vote, well, not just this once, but if you haven't already done it, to actually make a stand for something better for the country. And, and I think we've got five, five days to do it. And it can be done. Clearly, the vote's going to be really close in um, Bradfield. And every single vote and every single second preference is going to make a huge difference. So that, that would be my call out. Cathy, thank you. And thank you so much for being here on the uh, Here's All We Prepared earlier section, but not being able to be here tonight. Kerry and I are about to rejoin everyone live to continue the conversation. Um, and um, all the best um, to you this week with the final steps of wherever you're traveling to. Thanks so much, Cathy. And Kerry, see you in a sec. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. The smoothness of the time machine. Absolutely love it. There was so much there to talk about. Kerry, we've got some questions coming in for you already, which touch on the kinds of things that we've been talking about. But great to see you, first of all, in the present and how I went through the time machine. Um, there's a question that's come through about, um, you know, can we regulate the Murdoch empire through legislation? But there's a more detailed question um, uh, that's come from uh, Tom Settleman, and he says, truthful and unbiased media is such an important part of a healthy democracy, but recently it seems so much of our news media has been taken over by misinformation and heavy bias towards one side of politics. We're fighting for an independent commission against corruption and an independent commission for climate change. Do we also need an independent commission for truthful and unbiased news media in Australia? Be nice if you could wave a magic wand and get that uh, that outcome. Yes, oh. but, uh, but it's not as straightforward as that. And and the minute um, uh, the minute governments uh, want to start talking about um, about anything that could be seen as a as a, an actual constraint on the freedom of journalists to to practice their craft in the way they're supposed to, uh, would leave people very nervous. And uh, and so it's a it's a it's a delicate balance about about uh, having press freedom and also having responsible journalism. What I do think uh, is absolutely needed in this country, and it's worried me for a very long time, and I'm sure it has many other journalists. Um, I don't care one way or the other about Rupert Murdoch personally. What I do care about is that for one person, one proprietor, uh, to ha to have ownership and control over roughly 70% of the print output of Australia, uh, plus ancillary stuff in broadcasting and radio and television, uh, and to have a print monopoly in some states in this country, and the capacity to actually shut down debate for one reason or another if it suits the editors of that one proprietor, Rupert Murdoch, I think it's fundamentally anti-democratic. We have one of the most, if not the most, concentrated uh, uh, media ownership um, situations uh, in Australia, uh, in the world. And, uh, and we've heard two prime ministers, two ex-prime ministers from both sides of the political fence, uh, Kevin Rudd and Malcolm Turnbull, both actually confessing that, that they were scared 
of the Murdoch influence and the Murdoch power when they were the, the elected prime ministers of this country. It's shocking, isn't now it? That, that, that is uh, an, an incredible thing to be concerned about. So I actually, I think they're right. Whether you call it a royal commission, I think it would need the powers of, let's, let's say a royal commission. Uh, a, a genuinely independent inquiry and no playing around by whoever was in government. Uh, frankly, to be honest, I don't think either side of politics has, uh, has got the guts to do it, uh, which in itself is a comment on the on the uh, undemocratic nature of the situation we're in. Uh, so my ideal would be an inquiry with the powers of a royal commission, uh, where the commissioners, plural, uh, were... Uh, above the fray and in terms of integrity were, were beyond reproach, whose credentials were beyond reproach, to actually set about not just inquiring into Rupert Murdoch, but inquiring into the nature and operation of media ownership in Australia, and basically take the pulse uh, of, of the state of media in this country. And it is against a backdrop of, media, of, of digital disruption, which not only has upset the commercial models, uh, the traditional commercial models of journalism around the world, uh, but it has un un unleashed that um, that that capacity for manipulation of social media platforms to the extent that uh, that those platforms can be flooded uh, with misinformation and with lies and uh, with an attempt. And others of people have boasted about it openly that it is a deliberate attempt to flood the mainstream media. Uh, to the extent that it, it loses its capacity to to dig down into those those uh, those untruths and those lies, reveal them for what they are, and actually keep people informed about what's really going on. So basically, the mainstream media is losing its capacity to check the truth, yeah. and that is also fundamentally anti-democratic. So I, I won't take up more space on this, but I certainly believe that that before any um, a genuine attempt at uh, at um, sorry, Very popular, <laughs> sorry <about this. laughs> uh, the phone has come through onto my computer um, that uh, that before any attempt uh, to come up with any new media policy uh, that that there needs to be this wide ranging inquiry into the state of our media and what actually constitutes a healthy model for ownership for for diversity of ownership in the country. Completely agree. And to get that out there and public, I mean, simply that process would help to improve people's understanding considerably. Now, there's a number of questions coming in, but now having heard from Nate and from Lara and from Kathy and from Kerry, let's hear from the candidate, Nicolette Fuller. You've heard so much tonight and you've had the chance to meet so many people um, uh, through this whole, um, through, through the, the specific campaign process, but of course, uh, to deepen the relationships the, that, 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 that you've had as a, as a long time um, uh, member of the community. It's been great getting to know you through this process and um, having a look at the values that underpin um, your standing um, as a candidate and also what you would like to see. So tell us now in um, response to what you've heard, um, how critically important um, is um, um, the, the arts and public interest journalism going to be to the way you will serve uh, people as a future member for Bradfield? Oh, great visualization. Thank you, Esther. Um, what I actually wanted to try and do was to synthesize what I'd heard tonight. It, it was a pretty intense there towards the end. Thank you, Kerry, but real hashtag Murdoch RC. Um, but also what I've heard on the hustings, or we call in Australia this, this out on the stumps. Um, and in doing so, I just wanted to point out for me, um, I don't I think that it's never been more important than it is now that the arts takes a front place because we are facing these existential threats, regional tensions, we've got the capture of Western democracy to self-interest we're just discussing, there's pandemics, and now which is my wheelhouse, we've got climate change impacts as well. And particularly like, um, like the Australian Parliament, we people need to see themselves reflected in the stories that we tell about ourselves as Australians. 
And storytelling, you know, it's essential for identity, for understanding and for respect um, with ourselves and between um, each other. And as Kerry says, for humanity. So when I talk about my vision for the economy, many of you have been on a Zoom before, you'll hear me talk about um, the principles of fairness, of environmental and social sustainability and of productivity. But when I talk about the arts, I want Australia to recognise the value of the arts. I want this sector supported so it could contribute to making us a creative, uh, mature and a courageous society. Um, and just like um, Ravenswood recognising the value of the arts through the provision of their um, Ravenswood Australian Women's Arts Prize um, to, that Lara successfully won <laughs> this week. So you know, go Ravo. That's the kind of thing I would like to see replicated. Um, but I do need to quickly declare self-interest. Um, it was alluded to earlier. I um, have a deep personal love for the arts. I met my husband through Bradfield's one and only now on life support community theatre, the Northside Theatre at Marion Street. Um, staging children's pantomimes and yes I was wearing full pink lycra as a butterfly and my <laughs> husband was a stage manager. Um, <laughs> well, nice. Wendy, Wendy Blackson's on the call too. Um, hello uh, we had Helen and Kathy Martin and amongst others it was just such a wonderful experience to be part of that theatre um, and our, our daughter has since also um, been part of Nate's group as well. My husband's had a career in, in, as a screen director um, for Australian drama and more recently returned to early childhood. So it's, I don't want to, I had to declare my self-interest about my um, commitment, but my commitment to strength shouldn't be diminished because of that self-interest. It's, it's, this is the sort of importance of art policy to everybody, yeah. So look, um, listening to what I heard tonight, I just want to recognise, um, and with my background in human rights, I think... I don't know if this is a stretch too far, but I want to recognise access to and participation in arts and culture as a human right. Um, we need access and participation in arts and culture that supports essentially democracy and informed citizenry. And those two aspects are at the core of the reason why I'm standing for election in the Australian Parliament. And, you know, and based on what I've heard this not tonight, I reckon there's and out on the street in the last probably uh, 12 to 13 weeks. There are three main things um, that I need to take forward. And remember, this is not a policy. These are my sort of things I've heard that I, I, once I'm elected, I, I want to actually have what's called a Bradfield Issues Group on the arts and media and, and the ABC where I pull in experts regularly to talk about how we form this together. But the three things are support for people and institutions, so just to rattle a few off, um, education and training pathways for artists and technicians, um, improve artists and technicians' wages and conditions, things like minimum call times or access to sick leave. Um, you know, I, my husband's never, never heard anything okay. such as long service leave or anything like that because you, your gig's only as, as long as, as it is. That's, that's it, job guarantee. Um, and maybe um, require, uh, a, a, how about this one, require a criteria and processes for the appointment to senior roles on things like the Arts Council to be based on merit and not on mateship. And uh, I think things like adequately supporting Australian film and sound archive is, is another one. The second area is around pull for demand. So that's around supporting Australian content through the de delivery of adequately reinstating things like um, Australian quotas, content quotas, children's content quotas to screen. They do it in the UK and they do it in India and they do it for free to air and they do it for streaming. We can do it here. Um, and I also want to look at plans to target content creation that more accurately represents the true diversity of our community. So first Australians, cultural and linguistic diversity, people with disability, to Nate's challenge, our young people, I want inclusion of you know, LGBTIQ plus people, just better representation of people more broadly. And then thirdly, um, push for better reliability of supply. So funding through the Australia Council, I was aghast when I saw the forward estimates for financial year 23, massive cuts to the arts, which is the opposite, we need the opposite direction <laughs> for funding. Um, and also too, it's not just funding for high culture, but it's also for community arts as well where that's needed. 
There was also, I heard um, from people in our community about the length of funding rounds that artists are spending so much time applying for grants that have to come around so quickly rather than doing their trade and being creative. And then someone also threw at me, which is interesting, the role of um, insurance in providing for arts and cultural events and productions. So a whole lot of people in our electorate that run arts um, ent or entertainment, um, you know, because of COVID, they had booked and paid for a whole lot of venues to run events, but there was no real good insurance products to back up how that might help them move through a, a, a time of uncertainty. And of course, with climate change impacts, physical impacts, we'll probably see more disruption to live events as well. So, if, you know, finally, by no means least, um, back to the idea around these essential public institutions like our SBS and the ABC, which has been systematically under, undermined in terms of its utility as a public asset um, for our identity, but really important for our democracy, um, that trust between citizens and, and the rest. It, they are just essential ingredients in our democracy. So it's more than funding and censorship for me. It's this systematic hijacking of, it's a big, strong word, but our 187 public institutions where ministers can drop in loyalists to the senior to board positions, to commissioner positions on the Australian Human Rights Commission, on the ABC, um, on the Australia Council, that's just not okay. We need some guardrails around political interference. Maybe people need to go on gardening leave for at least five years after being politicians, but the idea of having loyalists there instead of people being put in there for merit is a problem. So that's um, just the beginning of it, I suppose, but that's what I've heard. Um, so yeah, thanks, Esther. Oh, thanks, Nick. It's just, it is so great to hear you outline um, all of that, but in particular from the foundation of what's unique about what you bring as a candidate. You know, when you describe the, um, uh, those uh, uh, personal and family and meeting of partners, or, or almost like a declaration or conflict of interest, or, a, you know, these are things that make us um, who we are. This is our, um, our humanity and how we, um, you know, find those extraordinary connections with people through the arts, uh, you know, to find yourself in that um, fabulous slash vulnerable position in a pink kind of, you know, to, to, to be there in an environment where you're performing, where you're, um, uh, you know, expressing one particularly um, fabulous aspect of yourself. This is how we uh, connect with people in unexpected ways. You know, art has a way of rearranging the way that we think and feel uh, and connecting us to each other in some powerful new ways. Um, now, we have got just a few minutes left and there are some questions coming in. It is just great to be able to ask these amazing people questions while we still have them. Kerry, there's, there's one for you and it's a big one. Uh, which is about um, what's going on with um, strategic changes and losses in the Pacific. So the question um, uh, is about Radio Australia, and it's from it's from Jane Salmon saying that um, the restrictions um, on Radio Australia seem to have contributed to the strategic losses in the Pacific. Do you agree, Kerry? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, I agree. <clears throat> and and uh, it's called part of soft diplomacy, if you like, but um, it always struck me as madness uh, when the ABC had had such a respectable presence, uh, not just in the Pacific, but in the Asian region as well, uh, where... Um, where uh, people outside these borders, but who were part of the, the region, um, had some sense to get a real understanding of what we were about and hopefully uh, to pick up on those things that we would regard as um, as positives about the kind of country we are and the kind of <clears throat> the kind of democracy we are so to have that uh, that ABC presence uh, diminished and cut off uh, is um, 
is I think a part of the problem of what's happened in the Pacific. I think, I mean, speaking as a journalist now and, and, and recalling the coverage of the Pacific that the ABC has covered and the stories that it has told, Australia has had quite a checkered history in the Pacific uh, in the sense that at times we've been accused of neglecting uh, our less um, privileged, our less uh, prosperous uh, small nation neighbours uh, where, where we have used aid at times to pull strings uh, and to buy favours. Uh, so our, our foreign aid budget has, um, has diminished as well. There's been a lot of ups and downs in our relationship in the Pacific, but one constant was that ABC coverage. And, uh, and I think uh, I, don't, I don't have a doubt that, um, that that has become a part of the problem that we face today. Yeah, yeah. And if I um, uh, now looking at it, we, we've got about five minutes left. Um, and so I'm going to go to um, uh, Nate and Lara on that question of uh, those broader, um, you know, global and cultural connections. Um, Lara and Nate, you, you might recall um, some years ago, there was a lot of talk about, you know, the Asian century, the, the Chinese connection. There were a range of um, program exchange and funding opportunities opportunities for artists to be able to engage with our immediate region, um, you know, far more comprehensively. And it was a time where also, coincidentally, we didn't seem to have these, you know, very blokey public stouches with, with China in the media every day. Um, let's um, start um, uh, with Lara and then Nate, very, very briefly, just tell us about um, the importance of the arts in fostering great global as well as local connections. Um, so as an artist, I, I think it's really important to um, have those opportunities and to be able to exhibit and to connect with artists from other countries. Um, I've been lucky where I've been able to exhibit regularly, well, had been, uh, as you said, uh, in Hong Kong about three or four times and had, um, I've had also had work um, in China in a commission. Um, but that has obviously it's stopped and that those um, relationships have really broke down due to, you know, political, uh, the nature of Hong Kong and China. Um, and that's really disappointing because that, that was, it could only add, um, oh, just give you uh, just such a great perspective on yeah. where you're from and, and that relationship. So um, I'm really disappointed that, that that seems to not have grown into something. But in saying that, I, I am seeing um, peers exhibit in Europe and America, and I've just had a show in New Zealand. Um, so Congratulations. Um, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, I'm just saying, yes, we, we want that. Most artists I know are, are really keen to, um, to, to think bigger than their, their town and to um, take up opportunities elsewhere. And so I'd love to see more opportunities, yeah. Lara, thank you. Nate? Yeah, look, it's, uh, I think it's about the humility that it takes to go to, you know, to, to take your own work and to your, your perspective and your culture and your to. To, to work with another artist in another, in another country. I've had the privilege of, of working a number of times in Japan and, and they, uh, you know, and often in a space where there's no, well, there's no translation, you know, we, you know, I'm a musician and in fact, we have to use music as a universal language. We just have to play music. together and, you know, which sounds, it's very idyllic and very lovely, but it actually is a thing. Like you actually have to communicate in, a, in, in another language and learn about somebody in another way. Um, you know, and then when we bring that back, you know, I keep thinking about in our area, like there are 40% of the people in Bradfield, you know, uh, were born overseas or, you know, have, have, have heritage outside the Anglosphere. So there's, you know, there's, a, there's, there's big lessons to be learned locally from those practices as well. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It is a fundamentally diverse nation yeah. uh, built on the foundation of diverse First Nations since time immemorial. Now, everyone, inevitably, as we said at the beginning, the time flies by and it is almost time to hand back over to Nick uh, to say thank yous. Uh, so, but before I do, uh, thank yous and apologies from me. So apologies to everyone whose questions and comments we didn't get to. But hey, there's so many of you and so many conversations 
to keep having with each other and also with other people between now and 6 p.m. on Saturday. Um, and so massive thanks to Lara Merritt, to Nate Jiltz and to Kerry O'Brien and in her absence, Kathy McGowan. It has just been fantastic to get to speak with all of you about these absolutely enormous and nation building issues and big respect to all of you and your work. And finally, Nick, thank you for entrusting me with this conversation. Oh, thank you. And um, echoing Esther's thank yous very much. And thank you, Esther. I'm going to channel the wonderful Kathy McGowan and just basically hammer home this one. If you like me uh, and you care about the arts, and our cultural sectors, you and you want to move the arts and the ABC off life support in occupied territories. And we have just five days. Um, so please come up, sign up if you haven't already to volunteer for the campaign. We at least lead, lead, need at least another 15 volunteers to cover 44 polling booths, which some have multiple entries and exits. Um, and that's for Saturday. And we also need scrutineers. All trainings provided, you will have fun because we are the funnest group ever. And you also have to vote like your future depends on it. Um, that's, that's what I've got, Esther. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. thank you, Nick. And good night, everyone. Stay together, stay connected, stay healthy, and uh, let's build the nation that will make us proud. Good night, everyone.